So, today's cast. Once Crown Peter's sexiest vegetarian, alongside Zendaya, <laughs> perhaps today's Academy's guest is best identified through his other professional accomplishments. <laughs> After leaving the Midlands Academy for Dance and Drama, Jay forged a successful music career on both sides of the Atlantic with chart-topping boy band The Wanted. In 2015, he lifted the Strictly Come Dancing glitter ball alongside Aliona Villani, and since 2018 has been flexing his skills on stage big, sleepless, White Christmas, and is currently appearing as Ben on stage in 222 A Ghost Story on the UK tour. Jay McGuinness, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for a lovely intro. Agatha. You're welcome. That was really nice to hear. So today you're here because you're adding author to the end of singer, actor, dancer for your latest pursuit. The book that we have before us today and everyone in the room is holding. A fantasy novel aimed at young adults, although after having read it myself, I'd say there's no upper age limit. Blood flowers. That's right. It's a twisting tale. It touches on themes of privilege, power, class divide and addiction. And like many great fantasy novels, what's really important is the setting and location. So what a better place to start. The characters that we meet in the book, their identities are all built through where they come from. You learn about their places through their stories and anecdotes and their emotional connections. And you feel their sense of identity through their home and where they feel or are told they belong. Jay, can you introduce us to the town of Calliston and tell us a bit about the process of building this world that you've made? Yeah, so Calliston is definitely an amalgamation of every sort of quiet market town across the UK. I'm from a town called Newark-on-Trent, which is uh, one hour 20 on the train to King's Cross. And I actually, when I started writing the book, people asked me if it was characters or setting or plot that I thought of first. And the immediate start in my mind was the setting. And I think, I over, especially after your intro, I just think of over the course of my life, I've seen and experienced like far more than I ever thought that I would, and, and maybe as much as I hoped that I would as, as, as a kid. But, but there was, as a child, I remember just constantly thinking about like going even into Nottingham was a really big thing. Like, oh my God, I'm going to Nottingham, amazing. <laughs> and then like hearing that my friends went to London, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to London one day. <laughs> and then like, you know, some of my friends went on like holidays abroad, and that was just like mind blowing. So that feeling of like, being in, being somewhere, and at the start of any story, I guess it, you start in an adventure in a small sort of rundown place. But I always felt like I was looking at like other amazing, exciting things happen, and I never appreciated how exciting it was to live in a small town where everyone knows everyone's business. And I'm from a big family. There's, there was seven of us, and my dad has six siblings, and my mum has five, four. Um, and I was just constantly surrounded by my siblings and aunties and cousins, and we're all on top of each other. And I remember just feeling like, I've, I've, I always felt like weird. I always felt like um, the, the book explores a lot of um, sort of alcohol issue related things. Mm -hmm. And I always found that the pub was really exciting as a kid. It's like this magical place that like, all, the, all the parents drink and then they dance and they shout and sing. Yeah. But then also it got a little bit scary and I was mm -hmm. like, ugh. And I felt like adults that have drank too much can be quite like imposing on a young yeah. kid. And I just remember that feeling of just sort of feeling like trapped in some way. Um, so we start, I started with Calliston as this sort of rundown little market town and that feeling of being in the community but wanting to exceed the outside world. And when you did that intro, I thought, yeah, I basically have you know, blown open any sort of box that I felt that I was in as a kid. And when I've gone around and met all you know, different kinds of people, I found that actually the most rewarding and exciting and meaningful place to be is home. You know? Yeah. That's it. And home Excuse for... me waffling, I will waffle continue. No, it's your passion. We want to hear about it from you. How did it, how was that process, did you find, taking it from your mind's eye, from your own personal experiences, all the way to actually creating these fantasy characters, putting it in a different world, and then putting it on the page so someone else could read it and put it into their mind's eye? Was it as easy as you expected, that process? The process of, of, of writing it felt just like the most nice relief. Like just getting really? it out. And also after years of like being in a band and then doing plays mm. and stuff, felt like I was using my brain in a way that I hadn't used since school and it was so rewarding. And also like, I was like, oh my God, I can feel my limits. I can feel, I wish I was better at this, you know? I was challenging myself. Yeah. But yeah, it just, I guess it was, I felt full of 
thoughts and feelings and just <laughs> kept getting them out. I think that the, the hard thing is this stuff. So the, uh, this, is this is roughly my third conversation publicly mm. about the book. And the fact that you've read it is such an amazing, weird feeling and relief. And um, hearing you describe it is still a, is a new and weird feeling mm. for me. But describing it is, is the hardest thing. Making it was pretty, it felt like I've got two more in me at least. Yeah, you can really tell that. So I have a copy, the previous, like, proof copy of the book, and I've thumbed it, I've read it. I'm one of those horrible people that bends the spine on Good. books. Um, Work your book. And, um, yeah, you can definitely feel that you've created this world, but there's, there's more stories to be told in it, which yeah. is very exciting. Was that intentional? Did you always start out with wanting to write more uh, books? All or? my favourite fantasy books, there are, like, 15 of them. Yeah. And it's not just about, like, um, like, you go and watch a movie, and it's like, boom, I want to get the release right now. Like especially lots of those longer fantasy series, it's all about spending time in that world and eking out even more discoveries. And then a character that you might like in book one, you might hate by book ten, mm. or that you're just bored by in book one. By book six, you're like, oh no, after everything they've been through, because you spend time with them. So I think I really put my heart into creating a world that felt like my how I view my world, and then the characters are just on the start of their journey. Yeah, you know? that's how I feel about this one. Yeah, you really feel that. These are like real characters. They have wants, their values change throughout the books. They realise what's important to them. There's a really nice... Um, so one of the themes in the book is class divide and privilege. And there's a really nice part of the book um, where Bear, who's the main character, is speaking to his friend Felix, who we meet quite early on in the book. Um, and we're, they're looking up to the sort of more important people in the town, the people that live on this place called Roofside. And they say... Do you think the Roofsiders think much about us? And Felix says back to him, sometimes we see them looking down, don't we? They probably look down the same amount that we look up. Was it a really deliberate thing for you to grey the lines of class divide and play on those classic tropes? And Yeah, I think that I felt very strongly as a kid. I didn't feel like we didn't have anything. I felt like perfectly happy. But I knew that there were people that went on holidays and had new cars. And I remember my mum always saying like, don't worry, because we don't have a credit card. Like, we pay everything with our money. You know, and I remember just thinking about that and thinking maybe one day like, I'll have a whatever it is. You know, I had ambition in some mm. way. And then, you know, as you're a teenager, you get quite angsty. And I remember like, feeling really sort of anti-rich people as I'm desperately trying to like, succeed. Yeah. Um, and I think I had a big chip on my shoulder. I think a lot of people that are working class struggle to sort of let go of that chip. Um, and then over the years, I've met some people that completely confirmed all my fears about what really wealthy people would be like, mm -hmm. and some that completely obliterated it. And I find that there are wonderful, talented, hardworking people that were born with extreme privilege, and there are also greedy, selfish, mean, small-minded ones, just the same as how I found people in my hometown. There was people with nothing that were arrogant and proud yeah. and bullies, and there were people with nothing that were generous and open-hearted. I found behind the curtain, it's the same thing looking back at you. Um, and I think maybe over, t over time, like, my chip has sort of softened and transformed. And I just sort of view every human as they come. And I guess we all start in different parts of the race, but twattery is across the board, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, I think probably everyone knows a few people they would describe that way. <laughs> um, and you do see that in the characters about what, what they're, who they're trying to serve throughout the book changes, whether it's their own means or other people's means, or yeah. you think they're doing something for other people, but actually you see their eventual purpose is something quite different. It was important for you to sort of trick the reader and lead us down one path and then bring us back? Is that something that you'd enjoyed in other fantasy novels that you'd read, and was it deliberate? Yeah, so I read so much really conventional fantasy, and I really, really loved it, and still love it. And so because of that, like I, I want to, and have, think, I think, made a very sort of traditional, and I lean really hard into tropes. There's like evil queens, and the mm. good kid, and the bad kid, and all that stuff is so, so familiar, but if you only have that, if you only have stereotypes and tropes, I think that you kind of might put the book down and be like, huh, why did I read that? I've, I've read that story a thousand times. So I was trying to write it in a way that is constantly leading you to believe one thing. Mm. And then, you know, those last few chapters, you know, I've had a few moments in my life where my head's been completely twisted around by just a sentence that someone says. And all of my, like, sort of 
preconceived notions about them were wrong for yeah. better or worse and both. I find myself constantly surprised by people, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. Yeah. And I, I, th I think because I feel that, I feel like I'm not a good judge of character sometimes. I definitely wanted to, the reader to feel that way. Yeah. Because sometimes you're like, sometimes you're like oh, I never saw your good qualities. And sometimes you're like, betrayal after yeah. all these years, you know? <laughs> so I wanted to feel, I wanted to feel that because everyone thinks they have good intuition because the energy you, you, you get when you get from someone, you think, yeah, I'm right. Yeah, we my want gut's to trust telling ourselves, me, yeah. My gut sometimes is completely wrong. I hate that. <laughs> yeah, it really like makes you not trust yourself, but you have to when you're meeting people and um, introducing them to you. One of the tropes that you do go into this book, and it's throughout the book, and you're, we're introduced to it very, very early on, is addiction. Mm -hmm. The people that live in this world, they all... Um, drink this thing called Ruby Brew, but it's never dealt with in like a negative way. It's just accepted. Um, do you think for you it was important to take something that people could criticize, like you could have easily been very critical about it, but you just pitter patted it throughout the book and people question it, but in a way that they just accept that it's never really going to change? Yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, so Ruby Brew is clearly like a magical version yeah. of alcohol. And I think across the UK, especially, and Ireland, we, alcohol is like sort of embedded in our culture. And that goes from weddings, christenings, funerals. It's kind of always there in the background for, mo for a lot of people. Yeah. I think it's like decreasing over time, and I'm happy that that's the case. But like, like I said, I remember as a kid thinking it was like this sort of golden chalice. And like, when you're old enough, you go to clubs mm -hmm. and you drink and... You know, like, I remember as a kid pretending to cheers with water. And I remember yeah. like, pretending to be drunk when I had, Apple like... Apple juice for beer know, and so stuff, stupid. yeah. But I think that I don't ever want to make any moral judgments on that because, like, some people just drink from the day they're born till the day they die. And, and I think that because we're quite a repressed culture, alcohol has become a tool across the board for people to connect. Mm -hmm. and it allows people that are shy or insecure to be the funniest, most engaged person in the room. And, yeah. like... That sort of lad with his top off going like, yeah, come on. <laughs> Probably inside he's like, everyone likes me. You know, yeah. like, that's it. And I feel like it, if, it's, if it becomes a tool that we use because we don't have nice sunny days that make us want to go and be free, yeah. just like freezing cold in a pub, like, fuck me, that was a hard day at yeah, work. It's January after all, yeah. Yeah, but I do, I do think it seeps into, into people's life. And I think that it's so easy for it to sort of take away the thing that makes them really special. And they feel like they can only be special if they are drinking and, and I remember certainly during the end of The Wanted um, like I was drinking a lot on stage and that sort of stuck with me for a while and I think it was it was because I was like stressed and unhappy and meeting a million million people yeah. and to for me to feel like I, I, I was being a good person and an uh, interesting person I would just be drinking and I was like why am I opening cans before I'm before I'm gonna go and like do a, a meet and greet like yeah. that's uncool I can definitely be me without this and thankfully, that's something that I've been able to like sort of kick away. Yeah, I, I learned from it, but I think I still see it all across my life and all across the country. I like, I, I you know, I've got an interesting relationship with it. Like, I'm definitely sober curious. Yeah, this really inter interesting podcast with a guy called Dr. Alex. I forget his last name. It's called um, Stompcast, where you go on a hike oh, yeah. and chat. And he's just been sober for a year. He was like, "It sounds like you're probably sober curious." I was like, "Yeah, maybe I am." <laughs> I think that. I think that the book is exploring those themes because they're things that are sort of floating in my mind. Yeah. They're still in my life. They're all across my family, all across my friendship groups, all across the industry that I work in. You know, like now it's my very first play without any singing or dancing. So I'm meeting like proper actors. Actors are nuts, by the way. Um, <laughs> but you meet some actors that are like in their 60s and you think, whoa, you've just been hammering it for 60 years, mm. you know? So yeah, I think I'm just exploring themes that are just really present in my life. Yeah, and the culture of what you've stepped into and also yeah. where you grew up and yeah, things like and I, that. Yeah, and I really don't have a judgment on it. I just feel like I just feel a lot of compassion for people that have struggles mm. and I feel a lot of admiration for people that get over them. And I also have to sort of take a step back and go, sometimes it's not that serious. It's just a fun tool and woohoo, you know? Yeah. Was it quite cathartic writing the book then? Because there's a lot of things that feel very personal but also have just been ruminating around in your mind. I think so. I think like any, I think any creation, anything that isn't like organizing or, you know, just sort of doing like hard legwork, any creation is like a way to express yourself, isn't it? So writing a song is, I think, more rewarding than singing a song. But singing a song is rewarding because I guess your interpretation, your emotion mm. that you put into it. I really hate listening to singers that are just, just technical, that are just yeah. technically experts. And it's like, 
I'd rather that you were doing all the sort of mental flips and gymnastics, but that it's costing you something to express it, you know? Yeah. So I think, yeah, maybe any expression is cathartic, any connection, even if that person like reads it years after I'm dead. The idea that someone read it and goes, oh, I feel that way as well, feels nice. You can share that with someone who you might never meet. Yeah. Yeah. A weirdly distant social monkey. Yeah. So I need that connection, but maybe one step removed. Yeah, in like <laughs> a very weird way, you like pass it along. Yeah. Um, talking about creations and connections, maybe we can move on to talking about the wanted. Yeah. Um, Love you the wanted. <laughs> Um, obviously, we all know you were in The Wanted for a number of years. You did arena tours. You made it in the US. You had chart-topping hits in the UK. Is there a highlight for you? Oh, my God, yeah, there's a million. Let me know. So someone said to me, like, when someone asks you your favourite movie, don't panic. You don't have to name your favourite movie forever. They're just trying to get to know you. So just yeah. pick one that you like and talk about it. So I've got a million favourite memories. And what would I pick today? Um, uh, probably one of my favourites is being on the tour bus. And um, it's just, this is totally crass, but it just genuinely comes to my mind. It makes me feel happy. Tom, um, we're not allowed to poo on a tour bus because then the, the bus driver has to like go and empty the tank. Yeah. So boys only pee on a, because there were only boys on the tour. Boys pee in the, and pee in the toilet and we have to stop for poops. So Tom, <laughs> Tom was desperate, um, my bandmate, and had to go. So he put a plastic bag in the toilet and then did it in there. <laughs> and then chased our tour manager with that bag. And <laughs> it's so gross, and so funny. Uh, I, I, you know already, Tom's passed away. That memory now makes me feel so happy that he mm. did those silly <laughs> things. Oh, what an even grosser one. Sorry, I'm going to tell it. Um, <laughs> I have drank an entire beer bottle that I thought was beer, but it was his piss. No! I'm so sorry about this, but I'm just going to carry on. So, this is why it happened. I was desperate for a pee before we went on stage. I think we were in Oklahoma, somewhere like that. Oh, wow. And I, I sorry, I just have to go because I want to get it out. <laughs> but I, this is now one of my favourite memories. Yeah. I peed into like a little water bottle and it was just solidly clear. And I was like, wait, I'm hydrated. Tom <laughs> accidentally drank it on stage during the performance and then sprayed it out. I was like, that's bloody piss. Only piss than that. <laughs> Joy of joys, later that night, we were on the same tour as Carly Rae Jepsen, who had the hit, hey, I just met you. Yeah. So I was stood in the little circle chatting to her sister, who was just really charismatic, cool girl, just hanging out with her super famous sister. So we were just stood around at the end of like pitch black out by the tour buses drinking beers. And everyone, in my mind, everyone thought I was so funny. Every single thing I said, everyone was dying laughing. <laughs> at the end of my beer, Tom went, did you enjoy that bit? And I was like, why? He was like, just drunk a bottle of my piss. So he got me back by giving me one of those, and I was drunk enough that I didn't notice. Yeah. And now I just think, wow, like, that is one of my also gross favourite memories of him. Because <laughs> we really lived a gross, fun life together. And it's an honour to have drank his beer bottle of wee. <laughs> um, for everyone at home, I'm so sorry. I, hope, I bet you all logged off. Everyone in the room, <laughs> we're in this together. <laughs> it was like, like a bit of a wild time yeah. and like, good memories. Yeah, we were young idiots, you know, it was fun. Being young and at that age and living in such a building career in such a weird environment, mm. did you have any mentors that you went to and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I think across the board, I've always had like um, like multi generational <laughs> friends. Like all my, mm. you know, as a kid, like we all hung out with our uncles and aunties. But across, like we had a really close relationship with our managers across the across the years, and then even like as we toured, a lot of the like sound engineers are still I'm still really close to. I, my sound engineer Drew and his wife and their now grown up kids came to watch me in the play. And I think it's so funny. My manager Damien and me are literally like busy mates for life. And uh, he's now currently making a new boy band, a little fetal boy band that are between 17 and 18. Mm -hmm. And uh, that sort of relationship is like so, it's so funny because I found myself rotated like a generation older. And as a kid, you know, I remember just sort of chatting to my uncles and aunties. And, and not at the time, I didn't realise how endlessly in love with me they were, even though I was just saying stupid stuff. Now I've got my nieces and nephews, and these boys that Damien's sort of like mentoring now, I feel so defensive about them being okay or protective yeah. of them. And I just get so much enjoyment seeing them, five guys just sort of like starting this journey, doing a school tour, hoping they make it. Yeah. Um, though like, I'm now, I remember we met Lee Ryan, who was in a boy band Blue, when oh, we yeah. were starting. And we were like, telling our family, I'm that Lee Ryan from Blue. <laughs> and now I'm Lee Ryan, like sort of meeting them. <laughs> and they're like, some washed up dude said hello to us today. 
So yeah, I found like those <laughs> mentor relationships have been massive for me. They're ones that last longer than peers. Peers can kind of zip around, you know? Um, I think that's the end of my answer. Yeah, cool. And then this new boy band that you've made reference yeah. to, are they going through the same issues, highs, lows that you and the boys went through when starting out The Wanted? Yeah. You've talked about school tour, which you guys did. Yeah. Um, is it the same in 2024 it as it looks was? It so similar. Aside from, aside from like, I think we were probably like a bit, maybe a bit more wild, like messily. But I do think they like kids drink less and they're focused on like looking really good, yeah. which can be a positive and a negative. Um, but yeah, like they're on their school tour and they're arguing about like hotel rooms and they're all about to move into a house and they're going to have big arguments about the bedroom. But I know they're going to have the time of their life in there. I remember the school tour being particularly exhausting because we were doing a club tour as well, which I don't think they're doing. So we do like two schools in the day and you meet like 500 absolutely nuts kids. They're like, ah! Um, and, then, and then in the night, we'd just go into these really dinky clubs and we'd sing and we'd have bottles mm. thrown at us and singing like, imagine you're just like dancing around and then someone comes on and sings an unreleased song. Like, just put the music back on! <laughs> but like those times that we were really tired and really young, mm. I look back, even when we got really big and we were doing like award shows and being in America and we thought that was so cool. We ended up being so proud that we put the graft in, you know. We yeah. went and did those early mornings and late nights, and yeah, they're they're in that and they're having a very similar experience. Apart from, I think not to dig on our old managers. I think they've got a way better manager. I think he's just way more with <laughs> it. Um, our our management loved us, but they were quite parental. Okay. Um, and that was positive and negative. Damien is really really caring, but he's also able to like snap them out of their like sort of teenage. Um, uh, what would I call it? Teenage nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Give them some perspective, yeah. maybe. Yeah. So just say, like, oi, sit up straight, look sharp, you've got a job to do. Yeah. Keep know? grounded. Yeah, things, exactly yeah. that. And he expects, the, he expects them to do really well because he wants them to work hard and show how good they are, you know? Yeah. I can see that really clearly now on the other side when I hear him just, like, pulling his hair out on the phone to them. <laughs> and you and the boys lived in a house together That's at the right. start of your career as the wanted. How did you keep grounded when you were all together and like hyping each other up? And you, it, start, it started moving from school tours yeah. to hordes of girls outside the tour bus and things like that. Well, I mean, it was so exciting. Uh, sometimes we did just have, you know when people say like, oh, I just need to go out and have a blowout. I never got that, I thought that was nuts. But then when I look back, I know that's what we were doing. So if you do get really early to be on like GMTV and sing a club track at eight in the morning, mm. um, but you're up at five to get there or whatever, then like you're in like a photo shoot and then you meet like a thousand people and you have to sign and be charming and make a real connection with them or mm. I personally like to. I guess you can just be like, next. But I, it was draining. And then that night, I don't know how we had the energy. We were like, let's go out. <laughs> so we'd go and just party and party. But in, in, those, in those quiet moments that we were all just like laying in our house, like, should we order pizza? And just chatting about how we feel and moaning about uh, our, our management or the record yeah. label. Like in those quiet moments where you just get to be siblings, like, it's when you see the sort of quality of someone. You know, if they really are like, okay, guys, let's clean up, let's have a proper dinner. Mm. They're like some of my nice memories too. Um, I don't know that we, I guess we were, because we were all from working class backgrounds, I guess we did think we'd won a golden ticket, but very quickly you realised, like, you have this immense pressure driving you. Like, if you didn't get a number one, like, our first song went to number one, our next one went to number two, mm. and we were devastated, which is just nuts. But you, then you've got this sort of pressure, this drive to prove there's a reason why you're there. Mm -hmm. So maybe that, I think ambition made us calm down sometimes. Yeah, pulled you together yeah. in the same direction. Yeah. yeah. And were there things that you really didn't expect? You'd had a, a theatre background and some sort of training. You didn't just come straight out of any school. But was there anything in you were like, wow, I never expected this is what life in a boy band would be like. Yeah, I mean, I think all the sort of hard worky stuff I, I expected and I enjoyed it, to, if I'm honest. Like doing interviews, even if it was like a whole day of interviews, and it would be a setup like this, and then it would be everyone here would be a journalist, and then mm. it would be an hour of talking, and then they'd rotate new ones. Especially when we started touring the world because there's so many media outlets to try and cover. Yeah. But I enjoyed all of that. I think what I learned or didn't expect was when you're, when you're singing, or whatever you sort of fame path mm -hmm. takes you. There's a certain element that is like you're selling your um, your personality, especially with a boy band. I think, mm -hmm. like I remember 
we once went to a, maybe quite topical because we just woke up Princess Diana earlier. We went to a royal, uh, I won't say which royal, it's like a, some royals' apartments. Yeah. They met us in a club and we went back to their apartments. And I remember thinking like, wow, this is crazy. And it was so much fun and they were really lovely. But then I started thinking about their perspective. And I remember thinking, <laughs> we're their entertainment. Like they're probably quite bored and they've just met us and brought us home. And we're all like from Bolton, Nottingham, Manchester, Ireland, yeah. Gloucester. And they're like meeting normal people. And we got this ticket to meet proper like wealth people. Yeah. You know? And I remember over the years that there's been a few times that I thought, oh, wow, like we're just here for um, for not for like music right now mm -hmm. or not for a performance, but just they want to be around us to see how we are. Yeah. You know, so weird. What a weird feeling that was. But there's been a few times like that. There's another family in America that, that I ended up sort of knowing. And every oh. time I meet them, I feel myself becoming fake. And I'll meet them and say, like, great T-shirt. <laughs> Shut up. It's not it's just a T-shirt. But but they are they are so from such generational wealth. Yeah. That it, like it's like a gravity. Like you go into the room and they are everyone is sort of focused on them and you feel that like I'm just here to show you what humans do. <laughs> you know, that's something I never expected. But you've probably but to been some that people that yeah, I'm you're that some person dude. in the room. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. That that sort of constant flipping from I'm with and or I'm without or I'm it's just I don't know, it's stuck in my head, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> weird way to live your life live your life <laughs> yes is this therapy <laughs> <laughs> um another sparkly part of your life was your time on strictly yes. after the wanted um you won in 2015 you beat two um soap stars in the final that's right you beat peter andre jamelia jeremy vine <laughs> and how dare you beat carol kirkwood <laughs> oh, um, i loved her so you iconically jived to the song from Pulp Fiction, just as Vincent Vega, John Travolta's character. That song you got an amazing from Craig Revel Horwood. Is that one of the highlights? Yeah, it really was amazing. Like, um, I think it was week three, and our rehearsals were going okay, but um, I often like had like sort of like binary, like really good or really bad. Like things go wrong, and then I sort mm. of fall apart. Um, and in the rehearsal for that, it just went badly. I think like my hair was being like they were sticking in um, like a fake ponytail because Vince Vega has like a ponytail. Yeah. I just remember looking back at the video and being like, oh, this is this is gonna be a bad one. But everything went really well, and I think the music was so cool, mm -hmm. costumes were cool, the film was cool. Yeah. And um, it, I remember as it finished, and like everyone was clapping, it was so loud, and like I just remember like the light being there, and then like Tess sort of like waggling us over. I remember like, I had this sort of intense like semi out of body experience. Like, I was like, it's so loud, like I can't really process what's going on. And I felt high, mm -hmm. like literally high, like what's happening? And I remember watching back and sort of seeing that, like I was stunned, yeah. but it's such a burnt memory in my head. Like of all the Strictly experiences, I remember random moments in rehearsal, and, yeah. but of all the like, the big day days, I've forgotten a lot of it. Yeah. But that moment, I remember even my brain going, you feel weird. <laughs> but like, I was like, I feel good, but I felt odd. But it was such an amazing feeling. Yeah, it's such a way to get that memory imprinted yeah. on you. And, yeah. um, and did you enjoy the sparkle and the kind of change from wild boy band life? I assume no one pissed in a beer bottle <laughs> in Drawing Strictly. No. Actually, I do have a toilet story then. Um, <laughs> I'm out, leave that for later. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, what I really enjoyed about that was it was like really understandable. So even though it was a big scary day approaching at the end of the week, yeah. it was like all week you can rehearse as long as you want. I think we did about nine hours a day, which was like on the upper end. And then some people had kids and would in a yeah. at the same time. So it sucks, sucks for them. I did feel bad. But um, it was just like go in and learn this thing and then like look at yourself in the mirror and move your arm and like look happy to be there. Mm -hmm. But then the, this day approaches and you know it's going to be nuts. And like there's just all kind of people flapping around, like getting spray tanned and costume and... It was so nerve wracking. Like I kind of forgotten how scared I used to get, but especially at the first time doing something without the boys, and I kind of avoided doing anything for like two years. Mm. And Damien called me when I was with my bandmate Steve, and I'm like, "Come on, bird, strictly have call. You've done <laughs> dancing before. Like it's time." So I got on a flight, and thank God you, you did call me, Damien. And thanks for that. Um, but yeah, I remember that feeling coming, and I would shake because. I just felt like so keenly that people were watching and they could dislike 
whether it was the dance or me personally, mm. and I really didn't speak very much at all, and I think that went in my favour. A lot of people were like, oh, what a nice man. It was like, because I'm just so scared I can't talk. And if I did, <laughs> I'd be talking about poo by now, you know? <laughs> so, so I remember that feeling coming and being excited, but I was so terrified that, like, I don't know, I felt so much pressure. And then with Strictly comes, the, for me, the most amount of sort of, like, press and articles yeah. than I'd ever experienced. Like, my band mate Max was always really like quite press, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, engaged with that. Yeah, sadly. His, his yeah. relation, well, not that he drove it, but that really good looking guy, dating really good looking girls, tends to sort of draw that focus. Mm. And that meant when he was having a good time, it was talked about, and when he, he was having a really bad time, that was talked about too, and I'd never be, I'd always been like random curly dude number two. So <laughs> suddenly that happening was like quite jarring, but yeah. also so exciting. You're like, oh my God, have you seen this? And like my family texted me like, yeah. is this true? I'm like, no, but funny. <laughs> um, that was something I didn't really expect, but I, I did look forward to the end of the week. I just wanted to dance first so then I could enjoy the night. Yeah. Dancing at the end was horrible because the whole time you're just thinking about your own stuff. Exactly, yeah. You always kind of want to go up first, I think, maybe, yeah. Yeah. yeah I um, do. do you think in that whirlwind of like media outlets talking about you and things like that, did you... Um, like, how did you balance work and life? Because doesn't dancing on a Saturday night become work, or is that life? I think that, like, that sort of blend between, um, am I enjoying this, and mm. it's actually really fun, and I, oh, wait, I like my job, and then it being in the media is weird. But I think, like, I'm sure all of you are so fulfilled, like, where you are right now. Like, you're here for a reason, mostly, I hope. And you'd, you're like, this is my life. Like, work is, in a way, my life. But I think that um, things like it being in the press. I remember, so Saturday would film the Saturday and Sunday show mm. together and Sundays would be off. And I remember at the end of the Saturday show, we'd go to this really small local pub called Tin and Og in Wandsworth, which is like a really old Irish, run by an Irish woman called Mary, like sort of old man pub. And yeah. we'd go there. And after a week or two of everyone being like, oh, from street, I mean, they knew I lived nearby, but they didn't, they never met Aliona or anything. Yeah. So the, after a little few weeks of everyone being excited that we'd be there, it was just like we'd go to our local pub and my, my twin brother and uh, his missus, we all lived together mm. at the time. We'd all just go in and like, oh my God, I remember one time they put on a buffet for us and my dad was there and they had like, I don't want to slag off the, the buffet, but the prawns were like swimming in water. <laughs> and we were like, oh, this is so grotty, but it felt nice just to feel like we were back home, like somewhere that yeah. wasn't you know, people going out into London for like, oh, we're a Strictly crowd. We never did that. We just went to the pub. And I remember my brother looking at the prawns and being like, they are vile. Who's going to eat them? My dad <laughs> goes straight in. Oh, yeah, good that. So, yeah, just doing like homey things. Yeah. That was fun. Things. Having the balance of the glitz. And yeah, then... I, feel, I feel in quite swanky places that quite like a fraud. So I don't really go to them very often anyway. Pubs and that sort of thing. Greg's is my jam. When you're in the swanky places, do you ever get starstruck? Because people get starstruck by you. There are so many teenage girls or were teenage girls that would have been obsessed with just seeing a glimpse of you. Do you are there people that... that yeah, I've got one for you. Pedestal? Yeah, go so on. So I met Zoe Saldana, who's like an, a, a Colombian, I think, actress, American Colombian, yeah. and she played like Nintiri in Avatar. Mm -hmm. and she was in a, in a film called Colombiana. Anyway, and she was also in Star Trek. Anyway, total like world-class beauty. Like, just obsessed with her, loved her. And we were at, um, what was it? I don't know if it was like Golden Globes or some sort of big American award show. She was there. All the boys knew that I really liked her. <laughs> so, <laughs> she's like, we're there, and we all sort of swoop and go towards her. And, of course, it's a bad alcohol idiot. Um, she went up to us, and I said something like, oh, can I get you a drink? But it was a free bar. That was my funny joke. And she said to me, are you old enough to drink? And then, and then I said, like, some witty remark back. Yeah. Off she goes into the universe... And I was like, amazing, amazing. And Siva looked at me and went, what the hell did you just say? Said, what do you mean? He was like, she said, do you drink? And you were like, well, I drink all the time. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, I'm what are you on about? I was, like, I was like, oh, did I say that? And I think I repeated myself, like, I drink, I drink. Just awful. Yeah. But I was just, I was just like amazed by her, you know, really just stood like, oh my God, she's tiny. <laughs> so small. Everyone in Hollywood is just tiny. But yeah, that's, that was a bit like a great memory. Yeah. See, everyone gets starstruck, even the people we get starstruck by. <laughs> Many times. <laughs> the Beckhams, oh my God, that was really? Wild. Yeah, that we um, we went and performed. Did we perform? No, we just went to Romeo's. I don't know what birthday it was, and they had this um like go kart thing shut down. He was a young boy. Yeah. He liked our songs. We got him a guitar and signed it. And just oh, like wow. being on a go kart track, there was like only like ten LA families there. They were so funny. Victoria was hilarious. 
but the whole time you, you're not yourself. You yeah. Like, Say things. <laughs> Be interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so now you're on theatre shows. That's right. You're playing Ben in 222. Yeah. Um, you're returning to your roots, having been trained in theatre when That's you were at right. school. Um, is touring with theatre different to touring with the band? Do you miss the boys? Oh my God, I miss the boys every day. Um, Max sent a text to me this week and, the, and all the boys and said, um, we need to make sure we talk at least once a month. I miss you guys. And I was like, yeah, we, we, we've been bad recently. But um, touring on theatre, in, in theatre in general, is so different because it's, touring in, with The Wanted was really demanding. There's also a certain amount of play that you can do because... Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to like not sing your bit and like do some funny move, like girls will be like, "Woohoo, you're so funny!" <laughs> or like whatever it is. With theatre, you just have to be on it. You just have to, you know, be at the the right time, right lines, right at attitude. Um, we've had like a really fun rehearsal, but um, I got a really nice comment from the director who said, "I really like directing pop music people." She said, you, "She said she directed Cheryl Cole in the same play, Two Two Two, and then Frankie Bridge, who like came in as a last minute yeah. replacement for someone that was ill." And she said, just so cooperative and open-minded. And I feel nice knowing that, that yeah. like, compared to like, real actors, as, they, as I think of them, um, that I'm doing like, the right things. But it's so rewarding. Like, going up and just sort of, we've got to be really pacey because the script's really mm. naturalistic. It's got to sound like people talking over each other at this dinner party. Yeah. And when it's really pacey, the reactions are so tight from the audience. It's, it's not just scary, it's meant to be really funny. And you can feel when it just goes really smoothly. And my other bandmate, Siva, he's just done a tour, which was La Bamba musical. Yeah. And he really enjoyed it. And he sang amazing and looked amazing. But he said, like, theatre is not for me. Like, he doesn't, he was like, it was just so exhausting. It was the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to do the same thing every day. Like, I feel like new, new, like, things to play with and, like, improve and uh, whatever it is. Like, I can sit at a computer for hours. I can, like, garden for hours and mm -hmm. make sure a hedge is perfectly lined up. Mm -hmm. Theatre is... That, that sort of satisfaction for me. Yeah. I want to do it. And if it's a really good show, the next day I'm not like, I've done it. I'm like, I can do it again. I can do it more, do it, do it different. So I can do it, if, if possible, Damien, rest of my life, we'll release a book a year and a theatre <laughs> show a year. That would be great. <laughs> stick with it. Yeah. That sounds like a good plan. And if the book and the theatre ever come together, say Blood Flowers made it into stage production. Oh my gosh. What would be your most favourite thing to see come to life on stage? Oh my gosh. From the book. With no spoilers. We okay, so I, I heard, I never saw it, but I heard about Lord of the Rings the musical. Mm. It was insanely expensive and they put like so many resources into it. And I just saw clips that were like a mountain that moves and these, the orcs wearing like those power risers that sort of make people bounce. Yeah. And running up on one of them, like, I don't know if he passed away, but it was really injured. It was all over theatre news. And then like Galadriel, the like sort of, blonde haired um elf was just this beautiful gold woman in like these golden tree structures i think the physical world of calliston yeah the the, the way the, the the lowest people live on the cobbled floors mm -hmm. and then the next uh, you know slightly richer live above and then they like sort of beautiful it's really visual yeah. yeah i would love to see the structure built in theater i love the idea that it, as the mountain in, Lord, in the lord of the rings musical mm -hmm. as they climbed the mountain the, the, really they were just sort of tumbling the set down yeah and so you've got this great expanse i'd love to see set moving as you go down into the sort of damp depths of the town and then up into the sort of sunlit tops. I would love to yeah. see, see that. Weird to think about. Come on, universe, come on. <laughs> wow, what a question, that's exciting. Yeah, and of all the things you've done, if you could re relive a life, writing a book, being in a theatre show, being in The Wanted, or do another week of Strictly practicing the <laughs> which would you choose? Um, that's a really hard machine. question. I think... I think, okay, I'll do that thing where I don't have to do the right answer. I just give yeah, answer. you just. I think just I would right now. I would pick. Did anyone ever watch the TV show Hunted, where you sort of run away from police? Yeah. So they did a like Z list celebrity version, and me and my bandmate Siva were together for two weeks on the run. It was the most freeing feeling ever because BBC can be quite strict with like sort of rules and, mm. and make sure everything's signed, which I think is fair because you know taxpayer money. But <laughs> Channel Four, like off the record, someone said to me. <laughs> Jay, so here's the thing. Right? You're going to be running across farms and fields and technically trespassing is illegal and we don't want to encourage you to do anything mm -hmm. like that. Always be safe. But like, do whatever you need to do to get out and we have a very, oh, we have very good lawyers. <laughs> they allegedly said that. They said, um, just sort of be safe, don't be silly, but if you need to like jump through a window and whatever, just go for it. You're free to do whatever you please. Um, and we did. <laughs> we like hitchhiked all the way around. Oh, the first week we were in Scotland, it was so fun. 
and like 10 seconds of it made it into the edit of the show. <laughs> but we were just like wild men. It was so much fun. I would do that again. Again, yeah. on the run. It was just so, uh, there's a similar show that me and Damien just watched that Harry Judd was in, The Amazing Race. Oh yeah. And he went across like Europe with his mum. Yeah. Anything like that, that was just like, just who would think you'd do that? Yeah. As a, well, it wasn't a job, but it was an experience. Yeah, getting away from things and having legal people to protect you. <laughs> yeah. um, so that brings me to the end of my questions. And thank so, uh, thank you. Does anyone in the, we'll start in the room. Does anyone in the room have any questions for Jay? Thank you. There you go, John. There's just a microphone coming. Hi, uh, oh. Um, I hope I speak for everyone here when I say, I really want to know the Strictly Toilet story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got you. Um, so it was the very first show. I won't. I won't go too far. It was the very. <laughs> it was the very first show, and we were. It was like maybe one or two minutes before they were about to start filming, and me. This is the fun thing about Strictly. All the people you meet. Me, Peter Andre, and Ainsley Harriet were the only few that needed the toilet. So some some lovely like uh, stage hand. That's the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Grabbed us and ran us quickly to the toilet. So me and Ainsley Harriet stand in the urinal, and away we go. Um, which was an experience in itself. But Peter zooms straight into the cubicle and we hear the most unholy noise ever. <laughs> <laughs> and then after a pause, I mean, Ainsley looking at each other like this, he just went, sorry guys, I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, and it was so much fun. And then we had to like run back and I was like trying to tell everyone, oh my God, guess we're just having the toilet. And they're like, action, and we're like, okay. That was the toilet story. And, I, and that was my first like live week. So that was just fun to tell everyone. I'm such a gossip, I tell everyone everything. <laughs> Thanks for asking. I feel so validated. <laughs> Another question at the front row. Hi, so I was going to say, um, you've obviously been in a band where you've been able to bounce ideas off people. And again, in um, stage shows, you've got a company where in director, you can float ideas. How was writing a book on your own mm. and having yourself... Um, to write the pro to the process of doing it on your own, your own ideas, and maybe you did have a team to sort of speak about ideas or tropes or things like that. But how was that process of doing something solidly on your own? Yeah, so it, I thought I was thinking about it in two in two parts. The first part being the first draft, which is entirely what you're describing, and it is me sort of having a conversation with myself, and I'm trying to trick myself and entertain myself because if I was reading it, I'd want to be entertained and tricked. Um, and I loved it. I remember I went to the library once with a friend who, who has a sort of similar job to what you guys are, have. Um, and she said, oh, I've never seen someone just, and this is why I know that I like to focus on things. She said, I've never seen someone sit at a laptop for eight hours and not move to the toilet or a snack or anything. I was just, Doo -doo -doo, and I realized, yeah, I just put music in. And um, so I really enjoyed it. It felt like, I didn't feel like I was doing anything especially pr profound or learning new things. I was just sort of playing a game in my head. And then when it became collaborative is after the first draft, I'd then have an editor come. And that was so joyful to be doing the same thing I'd already done, because <laughs> I like repeating, and to have these notes in the margins. And my, I, my editor's changed a few times, but I remember one of them was Jen. And I'd just always see like a little red thing, would say Jen, and I'd click it. And then she'd have some thoughts and I'd be like, oh, she's read it and she thinks it could be like this and she thinks that. And it was just like, it was delightful. And I, I, I wrote, a a little thank you to her and just said like, I don't know if I've, I'd, I'd ne oh, I, hadn't, I have never met her. I don't know if she's received the message, but I just said like, thanks for being there in the margins. It was so fun. And has anyone ever seen the movie um, Her with, um, what's her name? Scarlett Johansson. So she has like a sort of, um, um, your Joaquin Phoenix is this dude who has like a little iPhone and she's his like the voice of his little assistant, like Siri. And of course he just falls in love with her straight away. And, and it was quite dark, but I just thought, I didn't fall in love with Jen, but every time she spoke, I was just like, I just, she's the best. She has the best <laughs> ideas. She likes my ideas, you know? Like, it was a joy to take it from solo to connection. Yeah. Fuck me, I really do waffle, sorry. I think it's a nice reminder of all of us drafting things. Sometimes when someone gets the red pen out, you get a bit fearful, but thank you for being there in the margins. It's quite nice, it becomes so collaborative. Yeah, Perhaps. you never know, they might have a little crush on you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got um, so on the theme of the book, so I'll ask this question from online. Thanks, Carissa, for your question. Are there any specific authors that influence your writing style or the themes in your book? Well, I do feel, not that I think it's comparable, but I read this long, long series of fantasy books by a guy called David Eddings, who later corrected his authorship. Authorship? 
uh, to include his wife, Lee Eddings, um, because she'd been so like integral to the books. Wow. Um, but that was like a really classic fantasy, like no hint of sci-fi, just some dude with a sword finding out that his aunt's a witch and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And I think that like it, this is quite a conventional, similar book to that. But then maybe I wanted to have a little bit more um, of a sort of base level gross humour at times because mm -hmm. I do have that. Um, so yeah, I think like a sort of conventional, conventional sort of um, fantasy stylings with just a little bit of toilet humour. <laughs> That's really it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Any more questions from the room? Go on, Hamam, I suppose. There's a microphone coming. Hello. Sorry, okay. um, you spoke a bit about the um, kind of trade-off that you have to make when you become successful and famous in terms of obviously losing privacy and any kind of um, normality in your life. Was there a particular moment in your life where you realized like, well, um, you know, I'm past the point of no return here. And in, in hindsight, do you have any regrets over fame or the process of becoming famous? Or is it just kind of the price you have to pay? Well, I think, I think there's probably ways of, of doing um, you know, visual fame, where you like get all the good bits and not all the bad. I think I don't know how. Like some actors just sort of disappear, don't they? They do a film and then you never see them or hear from them. And I sort of try and be that. Like I don't want to go to like sort of a place that's you're going to get a photograph eating, you know. So I think I've tried to like put a, as much as I can a restraint on that sort of exposition because I do like to just feel normal. So. Um, one example of me trying to sort of keep that is probably that I live in LA, where like I'll only rarely be stopped, and um, and if I am, it's normally like an English tourist. Like you'll never guess who I met, um, <laughs> which is lovely. But I think that's one of the one of the driving forces that's kept me there. But I also think that sort of you miss out, I, and sometimes I do feel I miss out on like my family and, and the sort of community and like. But sometimes like my third spaces here are ruined. So like if I if I do want to go into a pub, sometimes I'm just thinking about like, is anyone going to speak to me, and watch, and and it's my own head more than anyone really looking. You know, it's not a very very common occurrence. But I also find like in Newark where I live, because everyone does sort of know my family and me, and and I, I go to the same school that my parents went to, and you know we we generation lived there. I feel it's completely natural, and I feel I feel like quite excited one day to retire and move back there, because they also come up and stop my mum. I remember as a kid, like walking around, the five of us behind her in town, and someone would come up to her and we'd be like, "Oh, she's gonna be talking to him for ages." <laughs> so I think I'm ready to just sort of—I do accept it for what it is. Like, I've spent a lot of life, life energy trying to be have real like interactions with people that stop me, and sometimes I do feel tired, like that I'm sort of um, giving way too much, and sometimes people come up and they're like sort of wired differently, and they don't know what to say or they're nervous. And so I'll fill in all the blanks. And so, like, I'm so happy to lay down afterwards and be like, ah, signings are so hard because I can't help myself. I need to look everyone in the eye and make sure that they didn't leave and go, I feel bad about myself for even going to that and saying hello to him. So I don't know if I, that I'm even close to answering that question that you asked, <laughs> but I tried. <laughs> Sorry. Are there any more questions? Yay, Hazel's here. Hi, um, you've been involved in quite a lot of creative endeavours. Who would you say are your biggest creative influences? Biggest creative influences? Um, I think, well, in terms of like the art that I do, whenever I was making music and writing music, I always liked, um, I love Newton Faulkner. Like I like a folky, folky dude. Um, and then when it comes to in all my creative endeavors. I don't know, like, I think I just want, I don't want people ever to um, work with me and think that I didn't care about what I was doing and I think that I didn't care about in, enjoying them as well as enjoying what I'm doing. I think Robin Williams was such a magic actor. And I feel like everyone he met must have just been like, oh my God, he really cared about and, and was interested in my joke. And I want to, I think life is more rewarding when you spend a bit of energy getting to know someone because you just find a million different things in them, right? So I think like creatively, a bit of a folky vibe. And then professionally, like I just want to be Robin Williams. God rest him. <laughs> is that close enough? <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, and then another question from online, which kind of links to art. How involved were you with the design of the Blood Flowers book cover? How, okay, so how involved was I? Did I give any suggestions? Oh no, yes. So, um, so Scholastic, um, we had like a meeting about what sort of vibe I would like. And then I sort of listed sort of like visual elements from the book that I would enjoy seeing. Mm -hmm. So something that isn't there, but was part of one of the suggestions was like, I really liked the idea of seeing the, the like couple side roof side. And yeah. even though there is a city in there, like I, I, I'm, well, I guess it's there, yeah. But then like the crow is in there. Also, I'm gonna tell you, shall I tell you a secret? Shall I tell you a secret about the front? Yeah, let's do it. So in the book, there's, there's, uh, there's a, a, a mouse, mm -hmm. right? And I won't say more than that, but I really wanted there to be a mouse in the cover. And then yeah. Scholastic, rightly so, said, it might lean it really strongly into like this is a kids book and, and it's it's reading as like kids but also young adults and adults mm -hmm. so they they put a mouse in negative space in one of the yeah. curling leaves which even though a lot of books have been distributed already no one spotted yeah. but now i've officially said it so yeah if you see between the d and the s there's just a silhouette of a mouse i was really happy that was in there um i like little things like that just so it's got a little bit of extra you know, you pick up another thing, like, oh yeah, there's that thingy majiggy. Yeah, you see another thing. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks, Nikki, for that question. Yeah, glad you asked. Any final questions in the room? Okay. Oh, going out see. with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> so we close. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Agatha. <laughs> Thanks for having me, everyone.